Wednesday at 8 p.m. in the meeting house here. And the speaker is the Reverend Robert Robb. Service next door today in the meeting house at 11.30 a.m. Speaker is Dr. Tim Donahue. The evening service next week will be conducted by the Reverend Robert Robb. A reminder as well, also a congregation meeting will be held, Lord willing, this Friday the 6th of November at 8 p.m. The purpose of this meeting is to further discuss the calling of a pastor and hopefully proceed in that meeting to endeavor to make out a call. All members should plan to attend and if unable to attend, should uh, proxy vote, submit a proxy vote um, by letter to the session nominating a member to vote on their behalf as instructed. And all these uh, letters must be in prior to the meeting uh, on the 6th. A call to worship this evening. The Sabbath evening is found in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 2 to 5. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, with twain, he covered his face, and with twain, he covered his feet, and with twain, he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Turn now in our Psalter to Psalm 8, and we're going to sing the 8th Psalm, the tune 225. The tune is 225. In this psalm, we will sing of the excellence of our Lord in heaven. How excellent in all the earth. Lord, our Lord, is thy name. Later, we'll be talking about his glory and how he set aside his outward manifestation of his glory. But Jesus is, was, and ever shall be. That, that King of glory. Let us sing now Psalm 8. Amen.
almighty and ever-living God, our Father, our King in heaven, our Redeemer, our Deliverer from our, our sin. O Lord, we come to you, Father, in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous Advocate, whoever lives to intercede for his people, who is at the right hand of the majesty on high, that great King of glory, of whom we sung about. O Lord, we are in awe of your magnificence, of your excellency. And Lord, we pray that this Sabbath evening you would open our eyes, our hearts, our ears to the truth and that we would feed upon the word of the living God and find satisfaction in that. Oh Lord, we, we come before you sinners in need of the grace of God, coming before a great king, a mighty king, a king of glory, a king over all kings and over all lords, one whom we cannot compare anything on this earth to. Dear Father in heaven, We pray, Lord, as we sing your precious and holy word, and as we hear it preached, that it would be more important to us than our daily food. O Lord, we pray as we hear the word of God that it would humble us, that even the King of glory came into the sin-cursed world. And Lord, that he was humbled even to the death on the cross. O Lord, may it enable us to see, Lord, how we need to be humbled before you. And Lord, that we would be changed before you. And that we would live for your glory, for your great name's sake. Father, we pray that your face would shine upon us in these uncertain times. We pray, Lord, that we would trust you more in these uncertain times and realize our dependency upon you, our great and mighty and glorious King. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us turn now in our Bibles to Psalm 24 for a reading of God's Word. Psalm number 24. Later we will be returning to looking at the temptations of Christ, paying specific attention to the second temptation in Luke's Gospel. And by God's grace, I pray that this will help us to see that He is this Lord of heaven and earth, is glorious, and it all belongs to Him. Psalm 24, let us hear God's Word. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof the world, and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. 
Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. The King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. May the Lord bless His precious and holy word. For our message now, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, we're going to be reading once again, as we did this morning, from verses 1 to 13, but in our message this evening, we're going to be paying close attention, not to the entire section here, but mainly to the second temptation, the second temptation accounted by here, by Luke, and this temptation has to do with glory, with glory. Luke chapter 4 Verse 1, let us hear God's word. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command the stone to be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil take him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from thence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. May God bless this holy and infallible word. Our title for this evening's message is The King of Glory, Tempted by Glory. The King of Glory, Tempted by Glory. This morning, we saw how Christ was tempted, truly tempted. And this should comfort us all. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 tells us this, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Or in another way it could be said, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses. The fact that He was tempted should comfort us all. Christ overcame the first temptation. 
written here in Luke's account of this gospel. He overcame the first temptation of hunger. He desires food, bread, a natural hunger to have. But yet, he did not submit to it, and yet, without sin. The devil offers Christ a way of fulfilling that hunger rather than waiting upon God's provision in God's time. Rather than taking matters into his own hands, he trusted God. He trusted that God would provide rather than going with the promptings or the suggestions of the enemy. You saw that in verse 4. Jesus said, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. He did not give in as Adam did. Adam fell because he failed in this area. And Jesus begins his public ministry to have victory where Adam failed. He overcame temptation in our place. His righteousness, his perfect obedience to God's law wonderfully becomes ours by faith and by faith alone in this perfect Savior, in this second Adam. But this evening we're going to be mainly focusing on verses 5 to 8 with the account beginning with, and the devil taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Again, another real temptation. Christ suffered for us all, but yet without sin. The temptation here was that of glory. A natural desire for Christ to have. Because He is the King of glory. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He humbled Himself. And it was not at that point that Christ was not glorious. He was. It's incredible. This glorious King of kings and Lord of lords, yet He still humbled Himself. His outward manifestation of His glory veiled veiled under human flesh. He does not enjoy, at this point in Luke 4, the magnificence and the joys of heaven while suffering on this earth. It is at this point the devil comes with something he would surely desire, tempting him while he is weak from hunger, The devil, of course, sees an opportunity. Why did Christ refuse it at this time? Of course, it all belongs to Him. As we read in Psalm 24, it all belongs to Him. The whole earth and all that it contains belongs to Him. What was the lie of the enemy here? What compromise of the truth did the enemy want our Messiah to make. And what can we learn more importantly? And how can we apply it to our lives? We're going to look at this second temptation under these four headings. Number one, Christ lays aside His outward glory. Secondly, Christ has shown the world's glory. Three, Christ has promised a false glory. And finally, number four, Christ sees the greater glory of God's kingdom. Number one, Christ lays aside His outward glory. Christ lays aside His outward glory. Why did this King of glory, this King of glory, go into the wilderness, a place of suffering. I don't know, we don't have deserts around here, we don't have wildernesses around here, but it 
If you ever see them in movies, you'll see skulls, death, lack of water, lack of food. To be tormented by the devil. He came to overcome temptation. Our second Adam. We read in Matthew 3, 15 of why he came. Matthew 3, verse 15 says this, And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it, not, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. To fulfill all righteousness. This is referring to when Jesus came to be baptized. Why did he do so? To fulfill all righteousness. He came to fulfill the law for you and for me in our place. And in, in, in so doing, and in order to do so, Christ has brought low. He has brought low voluntarily to suffer for sinners like you and I. He is humiliated. We might think of ourselves, if we ever hear this word humiliated, we might think embarrassed, but that's not really the sense in which we're thinking of here. This king of glory in heaven enjoys nothing but perfect bliss and joy among the other persons of the triune God. But he is brought into the sin-cursed world. He is humiliated, brought low, no longer well, he is today in that exalted state. But when he suffered, he was humiliated. Nothing can take, and we must emphasize this, nothing can take away from his glory. Even at this state of humiliation, he was glorious, worthy of all praise, worthy of all honor. Even at this stage, without food, without comfort, without the joys of heaven, still worthy of all praise and all honor, yet without the outward manifestations of His glory as would be in heaven. His glory can never, ever change. It cannot be added to and it cannot be taken away from. It is not that Christ ceases to be glorious, but how it is revealed, how how it is revealed, and in such brought to the state of humiliation. He was and ever will be this King of glory. As we pointed out this morning at the end of our genealogy in Luke chapter 3, He is identified with Adam. Verse 38 of Luke chapter 3, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam. And at the beginning of that genealogy, verse 23, Jesus himself being about 23 years of age, being as it was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli, traces him right back, identifies him as true man, the son of Adam, the son of God. This genealogy which goes right back to the beginning. He, like all those before him, subject to the law of God. However, what is different? He would obey the law. Unlike everybody else who came before him, he would obey the law perfectly. Christ left behind the glories of heaven. glories of heaven. We can't even imagine how amazing and how wonderful and how joyful heaven will be. But He left the glories of heaven to suffer for a people 
where sinners, criminals, would never seek after him. He made himself, as the Bible tells us, of no reputation. The Greek word almost has a sense of emptying yourself. He made himself of no reputation, as it says in Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, verse 7, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in, the, in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. leaving behind the joys and the perfections and the glories of heaven. I dare say none of us will ever want to leave heaven once we get there. But he leaves behind that, humbles himself, even to the worst excruciating death known. Crucifixion. Nailed to a cross. we have any idea what He laid aside for you and for me? It's incredible. Many first century Jews, they were not expecting someone to come and suffer in such a way. It sounded bizarre to them as we see in the Old Testament. He is this King of glory, mighty in battle. What did they think? Well, he will come. He will get rid of these nasty Romans, these occupiers in our land. That's what we like. We like this powerful king. They just didn't like the other part, the suffering servant part, the, the part spoken about in Isaiah 53, that he would suffer. No. Yes, in a sense he is a mighty king who will put all his enemies under his feet, but in his time and in his way. Isaiah 53 said he would come and he would have no form or comeliness. There is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, Physically, from the point of view of a human person, there was nothing that inspired mere men to go, wow. Of course, they should have bowed before him. But despised and rejected of men, this king of glory came and allowed himself to suffer this wretchedness. And it is in this context, because unless we get this context, we won't get any grasp of the temptation before the Lord in this glory. He deserves this glory. And the devil comes to him, offering him in this humiliated state a kingdom another kingdom. But unfortunately, this evil enemy, he offers it in the wrong way at the wrong time. Christ's exaltation will come later. We looked at how Christ lays aside His outward glory. Number two, Christ is shown the world's glory. Christ is shown the world's glory. Luke chapter 4, verse 5 once again. And the devil take him up into a high mountain 
showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. It's almost like someone who is very proud of their possessions. Does the devil seem here to think that Christ will be impressed in his present state of weakness and humiliation? We might think of someone who has bought a nice new sports car and might be showing it off to someone. Or we can think of a biblical example of King Hezekiah who showed off in a proud manner to the Babylonians, which led to him being corrected. The devil says in verse 6, All this authority I will give you. He claims that it has been given to him, and he claims it has been given to him to give to whoever he wants to give it. There is a certain glory from the world. There is a certain glory from the world which the devil claims for himself, for this fallen world follows him. But does he truly have authority to give it to whom he wants to? Ultimately, it is an absolute lie. Ultimately, the true authority comes from God and not from men. It is God who gives it to whomever he wills. Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. Dealing with the, the humiliation of Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel 4, verse 17, it says this, This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomever, whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basis of men. Anyone who's in authority right now, it is under the sovereign control of Almighty God. We may not like our politicians, but they're there by the power of of Almighty God. Sometimes those wicked leaders can be a judgment upon a wicked nation. It is God who gives it to whomever He wills. But at the same time, there is a certain half-truth here. There's a certain half-truth that the devil tempts Christ with. He has an authority of sorts. In Ephesians 2.2, 2, what is he called? The prince of the power of the air. The Bible calls him that. In Revelation 13, there is a temporal authority given to this enemy. In Revelation 13, it says this, verse 2, The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and grace authority also verse 7 of the same chapter and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and power is given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations There is a certain power. There is a certain authority 
And there is a certain glory that has been given to this enemy. Men who are fallen and in rebellion against God give this enemy glory. That's a scary thought, isn't it? They follow after his example. I don't know if we've ever thought about it like this. In John 14:30, it says he is he's described as the ruler of this world. Jesus says, "I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. The ruler of this world. He's called the God of this age in second the God of this world in Second Corinthians, chapter four, verse four. The ruler of this fallen ethical world system. The ruler of this fallen ethical world system. No, he's not the ruler in the sense in which he's got absolute control. But this fallen world, this world that is still in Adam, still in rebellion, has submitted unto him and given this enemy glory. So this is why there's a certain half-truth. And this is why there's a temptation here. This is something that people can often struggle with. That if someone is not a believer in Jesus Christ, your nice neighbor, someone you witness to, someone you might really like and have a chat with, they might seem like one of the most helpful, nice people you've ever met. But unless they are a believer, unless you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are giving glory to this enemy. You are part of this world ethical system ruled by the devil. It's a hard thing for most of us to wrap our heads around. We find it impossible that this enemy is served by so many People, perhaps even people within our own families who we love and we want them to come to Christ. There is no neutrality, is there, in this battle? Does this give a sense of urgency in our efforts to reach the lost for Christ? The fact that there's no neutrality... Heaven is not for nice people. Heaven is for those in Christ. You're either trusting and following this Christ or you're following this tempter. This evil tempter. A tempter so evil, so wicked, he goes before the King of Kings, the Lord of Glory. Shows them all the world's glory in an attempt to what? The devil offers the world one he has no real authority to give. Because he's looking for his own glory. Number three. So we looked at the last two points. Christ lays aside his outward glory. Two, Christ has shown the world's glory. And three now, Christ has promised a false glory. We've talked about how the world has a certain kind of glory. But we also need to talk about what false thing the devil promises. What is offered before Christ is really false. He isn't really offering something wonderful. As the devil claims. The Bible tells us the devil is an angel of light. It just appears wonderful. And that is why sin is so enticing. The devil is almost claiming. The devil is almost claiming that Christ will be getting glory here. But will he? Is that true? He has promised something false and deceptive. 
If Christ submitted, who would get the glory? Verse 7. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. I'll give you all the glory. Just worship me. He packages it in such a way that, well, you'll really get the glory. You'll get all the benefits of the kingdoms of this world. The devil himself benefits if Christ had submitted to him. Remember how that the devil offered what I, but the devil offered Adam, it sounded wonderful, didn't it? It sounded glorious. Genesis 3, verse 5 says this. Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened, ye shall be as gods. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Sounds great, doesn't it? If you do this, you'll be as gods. Another way you could translate that is, you will be like God. The word Elohim can be translated, depending on the context, gods or God. You'll be like God. It sounded wonderful, but it was disastrous. What came? Did Adam really get something wonderful out of that exchange? Did he get something wonderful? No, he got disaster. Sin taken out of the Garden of Eden. The devil will present you something. It sounds wonderful. Follow me. Serve me and I will give you everything you want, whatever you want. Just rebel, cheat, steal, and I will give you whatever you want. Isn't that the the world philosophy in a lot of ways? The ends justify the means. It doesn't matter how you do it. Just as long as you get there. But in the end, the devil gets the glory. The sin leads to disaster. If Jesus listened to the devil, it would have led to disaster. He offered a false glory, a trick to deceive. If Jesus had listened to the devil, there would be no salvation for you and for me. There would be no hope for any of those created in the image of Almighty God. No hope. There would only be death. No glory there. There would only be death. The devil in his rebellion wants to be like God and wants the worship and the praise owed only to him. Only to God. Now here's the thing. The devil wants to be like God. He wants to receive worship as well. It says in Isaiah 14, 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, Lucifer said. This is what he does to tempt us. He offers something, but it's really a trick. It's really a deception, and it really doesn't offer what it promises. It really provides something else. How many people become famous? They work their whole lives to be the top of their sport, top of their profession, whatever it is. Especially if they have had to do immoral things to get there, either in business or whatever. How many of them are miserable when they get there? They're at the top of the mountain and they don't want it anymore. How many of these people Their lives end in tragedy. They've listened to the half-truths of the devil. They've listened to the false glory of the devil. They want glory now. They want glory in this world. They want it now.
what are our priorities when we think of glory now versus glory in the world to come? What about the worship services? What about the prayer meetings? Do we set aside glory now rather than glory in the world to come? When there's evangelism, do we set aside glory now for the world to come? Do we say, this is my priority? Glory in the world to come. Not here, not now. It's tempting, isn't it? It entices us, it pulls us each way. The world wants us, not in church, not on our knees praying before God. It wants us distracted to have glory now rather than the world to come. The devil does not care about you. He only wants to inflict a wound. A wound on the heel of the woman as described in Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15 says this. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Thou shalt bruise his heel. The devil cannot inflict a wound on the head. He can't hurt Christ, but he can strike like the serpent he is at the church. And that can happen in getting God's people to disobey God and to serve Him. All would have been lost if Christ had worshipped him as described in Luke 4, 7. It wouldn't have been his. It wouldn't have been his. All shall be thine? No. All would have been lost. All would have been lost. His exaltation, gone. Resurrection, gone. Because he would be now a sinner. And rather than having no corruption as he had in the grave, he would have corruption. But praise God, he rejected the advances of the enemy, saying, get thee behind me, Satan. The the enemy will whisper in our ears, will want us to follow the way of glory now rather than the promised glory of the world to come. He promises us glory, but he really offers disaster. The devil offers us what looks like an easy way to glory. The easy way to glory. That's why, you young people, it's so much easier to think, well, why don't we do this way? Sometimes in the hindsight of wisdom, you see that that way leads to disaster. The easy way to glory. The way that rejects suffering and the cross. Remember Peter. Jesus tells him that he came to suffer and die. In Matthew 16, describes his account, Matthew 16, verse 20. Matthew 16, verse 20. Verse 22, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, say, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Peter doesn't like the idea that he came to suffer and die. The idea of him suffering, this king of glory suffering, is 
strange to him. But what did Jesus say? But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. The glory of men versus the glory of God. Peter here was against, for that moment in time, he was against the way of the cross. And that way is satanic. Finding number four. Christ has promised the false glory, but Christ sees, verse, or point four, Christ sees the greater glory of God's kingdom. The greater glory of God's kingdom. Luke 4, verse 8, And Jesus answered and said unto, the, unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. It is God's glory we are to serve. It is God's and none, no one else's. The devil's offer on paper and on from the mere look, it may look impressive. All the kingdoms of the world, it'll all be yours. All be yours. But it is nothing compared to the glories of heaven. Even if he could fulfill his promise, even if it wouldn't lead to disaster, the glories of the kingdom to come far greater than anything he was even showing him. Nothing compared to the glories to come. The glories of the world to come. The devil wants him to worship him for his tiny kingdom. His tiny kingdom. May I say even a pathetic kingdom compared to God's. A kingdom which in reality doesn't belong to him. If the devil does anything, he does it, as we know from Job 1 and 2. He does it by the permission and the sovereign will of God. Satan's attempt is nothing more than to offer cheap glory. Cheap glory. Petty, futile. But God's is far greater. Far greater. A kingdom without beginning and without end. He, and because of this, He is glorious. He is the one worthy of our worship. That is why one of the solas of the Reformation, Sola Dei Gloria. There was an expression in Latin by the Jesuits which would basically say to the to the greater glory of God. They believe they can add in some way, shape, or form to God's glory. And all to the glory of God. He is the one worthy because of this, of our worship. There is no true glory in this rebellion and worshiping other gods. Jesus here quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. He quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13, which says this, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve Him, and shalt swear by His name. And this is in the context and when they're warned not to be tempted to follow the gods of the other nations. There can be a temptation, as there was when they were suffering during the times of the wilderness, going through as they did during the book of Numbers, to trust in a foreign god, to trust in a god of another nation who had promised them good crops or whatever it may be. 
And that's what happens when we worship a false god. We think that that god can provide us with something that God cannot himself provide. That is why idolatry is so evil and so wrong. False gods are not to be served. False gods are not to be worshipped. False gods offer nothing but cheap glory. And everything offered by the devil, all the kingdoms of this world, is nothing because it is without God. It is without God. And because of that, there is no true glory. Isaiah 42, verse 8 says this, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another. I will not give to another. The devil and his minions will only offer you a crown without a cross. Glorification without humiliation before the throne of God and a diminished, counterfeit glory which will not satisfy. God's glory is the greater glory, the greatest glory we can ever serve. Oh, what Christ set aside for us, for sinners like you and me, to be tempted. Do you see what he gave up to live as one of us? To die as one of us? Is there anything in this world that you have that you're not willing to part with for the sake of Christ? And I mean anything. Is there anything more important than Him? Everything you have, your family, your home, your car, the the seats you're sitting on, God has given it to you. The breath entering into your lungs right now, it all belongs to Him. He humbled himself. He gave up everything to be as one of us, to suffer as one of us, and to die in our place. Surely we should also be willing to humble ourselves, to put others first, to put his glory first, and to endure whatever the darts of the devil is for his glory's sake, will we not suffer for his sake? We might think, well, where am I suffering? That's part of the problem sometimes. We're so comfortable in the West. We're so casual about our Christianity. Our religion is so private that we don't suffer for it. Will we not suffer for his sake? Will we not suffer for his glory? Will we see this very day that whatever is in the way, whatever is taking the glory away from God, that we will say, no more of this. That we will come boldly before the throne of grace, to worship Him, to pray before Him, and to value fellowship with the saints. Why? These are foretastes of the glory to come. Amen. Let us turn now to Psalm 24. Psalm number 24 in our Psalters. And we're going to sing verses 1 to 6. The earth belongs unto the Lord and all that it contains. Unto 
the Lord and all Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the glories and the depths of the wisdom that passes all understanding, the richness, Lord, of your Word, which we can barely fathom the greatness and the graciousness of what you have done on our behalf. Your glorious Son came into this world and came in the likeness of a servant. O Lord, may we never take that for granted. How He left behind, Lord, the comforts, the glories, the magnificence of heaven to be born under the law. And Father, we pray that we would ever seek to glorify Your Son, to follow Your Son. Lord, that Your people would love one another within your body as Christ loved his people. 
the great shepherd of our souls who feeds us good things from his word. O oh, Father, we are but sinners, wretched sinners. Our greatest deeds are but filthy rags before you. But we thank you, Lord, that we can come boldly before the throne of grace because we are now clothed in robes of righteousness, royal robes. And we can come before you, we thank you, because of your Son who represents us, the final Adam. That Adam would succeed in the place of the first Adam and obey the law that Adam would come to fulfill all righteousness and suffer the penalty which we deserve. Oh Lord, thank you. We pray, Lord, for this island of Ireland. The multitudes will come to know Christ, this merciful Savior, this King of kings and Lord of lords who is tempted in all points as we are, and yet without sin. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.